if you look at the numbers that the U.S. MSOs have been generating, they are fantastic. You know, you're seeing revenue growth, um, you know, somewhere around 25% per quarter, and you're seeing the EBITDA growth in sort of the 10 to 15% per quarter, which is fantastic. Bruce Campbell joins me now, portfolio manager of the Stone Castle Cannabis Growth Fund and the chief investment officer of the Plant Based Investment Corp. Bruce, welcome back. Yeah, thanks for having me on today. You bet. Bruce, uh, summer doldrums is kind of eking out an ending here, yet the uh, average price of the cannabis stock has drifted by, call it, 30 to 40% lower from February highs this year. What has driven the drift downward besides the usual summer doldrums, et cetera, summer. And what is there that's going to turn it around in the near future? Well, we kind of look at it and think there's a couple of different factors that drove the prices down to where they were. If you look at when things peaked out, which I think if you looked at most charts, it was probably the 16th of February to now. Yeah, you're right. You know, we're seeing prices down 40, 50, in some cases, even more. And really, if you looked at the same time, the overall market, we saw really a risk sentiment change on the overall market. So it went from being, you know, kind of full risk on with like, reckless abandonment for you know any type of uh, worry about things going down to now where you went through the summer period where people were more concerned about you know what the downside was and what might happen so that was number one so you saw this overall broad change in sentiment number two was you know when biden got elected there was thought that you know this was going to be pushed through cannabis uh, legalization on a real quick basis and by you know kind of February March April we were going to see you know US federally legalized and you know everyone was going to have a big party and certainly that was hasn't been the case and you know the legislation has been sort of kicked down the down the road a bit um, what's come out from 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 uh, some of the politicians in the US is not really kind of have the same teeth that that a lot of people were expecting and then probably the third thing that's but that's contributed as well was that in the U.S. there's been some of the big asset um, custodians. So I think about, you know, where hedge funds and mutual funds and pension funds custody their assets who have decided that they will no longer hold cannabis assets. And so there was there was, um, you know, some asset managers who have had to sell down positions because they don't want to switch, you know, custodians and they've had to sell down positions. So you've kind of seen a, uh, those three factors, in our opinion, that have contributed to this. Yeah, you bet. Well, so California announced over $5 billion in revenue from cannabis in, uh, I guess it was July. Um, meanwhile, in the same time frame, Canada had only done 300 and some odd million entirely. Uh, why is there such a higher volume of sales per capita in California relative to Canada? Well, I mean, it's it's a market that's been been there from a legalized basis for a lot longer than Canada. I mean, they had... You know, everyone can make the case that they had this medical system only there. But the reality was it was pretty easy to get, you know, cannabis in, in a recreational form legally through through any type of um, dispensary. Right. So, I mean, I think that's part of it. And and then, you know, obviously in Canada, there was to start with, there was a real lack of um, number of retail outlets, especially if you look at where you are in Ontario. You know, it started off, you know, I remember seeing the stat. Uh, a couple of years ago that there was 1,200 uh, beer and wine and liquor stores in Ontario. And, and for the longest time, there was probably less than 40 cannabis locations. And I mean, they're ramping that up now and it's becoming more convenient for people. But most people, you know, if you sort of think about consumption of cannabis on the same lines of alcohol, most people stop by someplace that's convenient that they know um, on the way home from somewhere. And, you know, in that case, uh, you know, it was alcohol. In this case, now it's cannabis. And so until those locations are really there, they're not going to drive, you know, 10K, 15K to go pick up cannabis. They want to do it where it's convenient. And now we're starting to get that rollout. So, you know, I suspect that you're going to start to see the numbers roll out in Canada. And then in Canada, it's interesting because... You know, uh, if you look at edibles in Canada, they're only two and about two and a half percent of, of total sales. We're in the U.S. They're, you know, kind of 15 in, in California in particular, they're 15, kind of 20 percent, depending on on the actual items. So, you know, that that's another reason that, um, you know, as Canada has a bigger skew offering, you know, I think that there's going to be more people who try it and then start using it on a more regular basis. 
Yeah. Your top 10 holdings in your cannabis fund, growth fund, are very focused on U.S. MSOs. Do you feel that despite, you know, some hope for the outlook for Canadian cannabis stocks that they're still not really uh, as good a bet as U.S. MSOs at this point? Well, if you look at the numbers that the U.S. MSOs have been generating, they are fantastic. You know, you're seeing revenue growth, um, you know, somewhere around 25% per quarter. And you're seeing the EBITDA growth in sort of the 10 to 15% per quarter, which is fantastic. If you look at, you know, sort of the big MSOs on aggregate, you're not seeing that in Canada. I mean, obviously the big LPs in Canada are still having challenges. There's oversupply of cannabis. Um, but what we have done in Canada is we've drilled down and looked at some of the niche players niche p- players so you know someone if you look at you know one of our in our top 10 is in diva and i mean they're um they're a manufacturer of um of edibles they do chocolates and they do gummies and they're you know they're about 50 percent of the the um edible sales in canada right now and so you know they're 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 a great little company but generally in the u.s you know you're seeing the msos continue to do really well so our focus has been sort of big msos niche msos and then niche canada Mm -hmm. one of the big uh sort of excitements in the cannabis space back i don't know a year or two years ago actually probably more like three years now was this uh excitement around cannabis beverages And since cannabis beverages are now pretty much on the shelf, I haven't heard anything, anybody really making any noise about them. Have they sort of petered out? Was it a flash in the pan? Did it not take off? It certainly hasn't seen the traction that that I think most people have expected up until this point in time. And, you know, you sort of look, think back and you go, well, Constellation, you know, bought out you know, a big chunk of canopy, you would think that they would have some sort of insight as to where they think beverages are going. Um, you know, we still haven't really seen any type of consumption lounges in Canada or the U S that's changing. You're starting to see, you know, different geographic areas where that's rolling out. Maybe that's, you know, where, you know, it, it gets more adopted where, if, you know, there's people can go and, and enjoy a beverage um, like they did, you know, alcohol, but you know, on the cannabis basis, you know, maybe that's where it'll get adopted, but we certainly haven't seen, that um, you know to the same degree that that you would have expected, and then and certainly for the amount of money that's been um, invested into the sector in specifically beverages. Yeah. So then, is there any new sort of product line, product sector on the horizon for cannabis that could give the whole sector a, a bit of a bump in valuation? Well, I don't think so. You know, we don't we don't really see anything. I mean, the California market's really the one where, you know, most product innovation comes from. And I mean, the products that are, you know, flour is still the number one selling item there. And then, you know, you sort of drill down from flour, pre-rolls are obviously fairly, uh, fairly big category as well, which is, you know, just more convenience factor than anything else. And then, you know, you sort of drill down to that and you look at, you know, some of the, um, some of the concentrate products. So the, you know, the shatters, the waxes, you know, sort of for the hardcore user. And then beyond that, that's when, you know, sort of more of the pure recreational user starts to go to, you know, some of the edibles. And those are, you know, typically those are the, the gummies are, you know, huge sellers right now, really across the board, Canada and the U S chocolates are fairly big. And then, you know, sort of coming in line there is some of the bakery goods and then, and then the beverages below that. Yeah. I've noticed there's a real slowdown in new companies coming to market to Mm -hmm. be publicly traded, especially in 2021. Do you think that's a symptom of market saturation in terms of the number of publicly traded cannabis companies, or is it maybe COVID related? Well, I think it's a few different factors. Um, Certainly there was, you know, the market just had so many companies come, you know, 2018 to 2020. It was just, it was, it was nonstop. There was another one coming every day. There was lots of private deals that were going to go public that never made it there. Um, So those are obviously, you know, pretty big factors in the fact that, you know, there was probably oversaturation. And then, you know, when you look at um, obviously what's happened with, with COVID and and capital markets, um, you know, that's obviously probably part of it as well. What we suspect that you're probably going to see of, you know, as opposed to, you know, more new issues coming, you're probably going to see more M&A coming. And we've, you know, certainly talked to a lot of parties that are looking at M&A, they're looking at transactions. We've seen some of that here in Canada. I mean, Hexo's been out, 
you know, buying. There's been, you know, some M&A in the U.S. as well. So we think that trend probably continues. You'll probably end up seeing, you know, there's been a number of these kind of marginal Canadian players, even some U.S. that probably makes sense to merge them together. So, you know, maybe if you're in the U.S., maybe you decide you're going to build the Nevada powerhouse, right? Where, you know, you got, you merge together a few companies and then you control that market or California, or, you know, I guess it's a little bit more difficult in the limited license states to do that. But some of the unlimited license states, you can do that. And then in Canada, you're probably going to see some companies come together where they have you know, different expertise. So, you know, you may have somebody who's really good at, at uh, edibles and then someone else who's really good at cultivation. And, you know, you can merge them together and get higher margins in both ends. Yeah, you bet. All right, Bruce, that's a great update. We're going to leave it there for now. We'll come back to you soon enough. Thanks for your time again today. Okay, yeah, take care. You bet. Bye for now. Bye for now.